Okay, so today I'm going to be talking to you about, um, oh, let's go back, uh, the Greyfriars Project. So you'll notice it's not called the Richard III Project, and that's because we never thought we were actually going to find him. And also, normally when I do this talk about all the interdisciplinary research that went into the Richard III Project, it takes about an hour. I think I've got it down to about 12 minutes, uh, so hang on to your hats. Okay, so I've got a bit of an unusual background. I actually started in archaeology and anthropology at the University of Cambridge, and it was there that I got really interested in how you can use genetics to answer questions in history and archaeology. I thought, well, I better get a molecular genetics degree under my belt. And so I went off to the University of Leicester, and all of my work since has been combined combining genetics with history and archaeology. So I've done a lot of work on the link between surnames and genetics, so genetics with history and genealogy, and also work looking at the genetic legacy of the Vikings in the north of England. So genetics with history, archaeology, surnames, this kind of thing. So I've been at this kind of interdisciplinary malarkey for mm, about 15 years now, and I think that's why I got asked to be involved in the Richard III project, and um, not because of this. So, this is something that my dad sent me. Um, he, it's a guy who believes in nominative determinism, so what your name is determines what you become. So I'm his poster girl, right? Turi King to Re King. <laughs> I don't think it's why I got involved, but I was really pleased to notice that um, Ada's surname when she got married was also King, and her first names actually mean distinguished first daughter, so maybe there is something in this. Okay. So we actually know quite a lot about Richard III. We know that he was the last king of England to die in battle, and he died in the last main battle of the Wars of the Roses, which ushered in the Tudor period in English history. We know that after his death, he was brought back into Leicester, where he was laid out for a couple of days, essentially so people could see that he was actually dead. And then he's buried in the choir of the Church of the Greyfriars on the 25th of August, 1485. Now, 1538, you get the dissolution of the monasteries. And there's this rumor which is arises about 100 years later, which talks about how the remains of Richard were apparently dug up during the dissolution of the monasteries and thrown into the local river Soar. But there's been a lot of kind of historical work on it, a lot of evidence which showed that this rumor probably wasn't true. And so we're expecting him to still lie within the remains of the Greyfriars site, if we can find it. So, going into this project, what were we looking for? And I have to say that actually this project was really kick-started by this woman. So this is Philippa Langley, and she's from the Richard III Society up in Scotland. And so the project was actually a partnership between the University of Leicester, the Richard III Society, and Leicester City Council. So what are we looking for when we're starting the dig? Well, we're looking for the remains of somebody in the choir of the Church of the Greyfriars. We know that Richard was age 32 when he died, and we're expecting that he's probably going to have battle injuries. We know he went down in battle. Now, we're expecting somebody. He might be a hunchback. Now, a lot of this is laid at Shakespeare's door, right? Because he describes him as this hunchback toad, and he throws in a withered arm and a gammy leg for good measure. But if you look at the contemporary sources, one of them talks about how he has one shoulder higher than the other, and the other one doesn't mention it at all, so we're not really sure what we're going to find here. So going into the project, we had five main aims. First and foremost, could we actually find the remains of the Greyfriars site at all? If we could, could we work out where we were? Could we work out where the church was, and more specifically, the choir? And finally, could we find the remains of Richard III? And we, uh, we assigned a set of probabilities to these. <laughs> so as you can see, we never realistically considered that we would actually find Richard, and little did we know we'd do number five before we did any of the rest of them. <laughs> Okay, so where do you start digging? Okay, well, this is the first really detailed map of Leicester. It's the 1741 Thomas Roberts map, and it has on it the Greyfriars. Fantastic, though. This is not actually the friary site. The land was actually bought by a local businessman, and he built his manor house on it, and you can see he's got his orchard and his gardens and everything. But you can actually overlay it with a modern ordnance survey map doing something known as map regression, and this gives us a lovely search area. So, in light blue, 
we've got buildings. In dark blue, we have got areas where we can actually go and dig. So we've got the social services car park, we've got a car park over here, we've got a wall there, and then we've got the Alderman Newton playground over there. So it's decided we're going to put trenches in, which will cover as much of the site as possible. You want to run them north-south, because we know that the main walls of Friaries run east-west. So if we run them north-south, hopefully we're going to run across main walls and work out where we are. So we've got about 17% of the original Greyfriars precinct that we can actually dig in, and the money to do 1%. <laughs> So, this is 527 years to the day to when Richard is buried, and this is when the trenches are going in. And we find, as you would imagine, Victorian foundations, and within the first few hours, this little bit of bone. Now, it's this bit here. So, what Matt Morris, our site director, does is he has a little kind of check. He makes sure it seems to be an articulated skeleton, but we've just put the trenches in. We have no idea where we are. We're expecting that we might come across bones because we might be in a churchyard, but we don't know if we're in the church, outside the church. We just don't know where we are. We need to get a license to lift remains, and we expect to lift about six sets of remains. You don't want to dig up the first six and then go, oh, actually, number seven's looking pretty interesting. So, you make educated decisions about which skeletons you're going to lift. So we decide to keep going. And pretty quickly, we start to find the remains of what looks like a medieval building. So we're finding out what's known as robbed out walls. People have come take the bits of stone they're interested in, leave the bits that they don't want. We find things like a medieval silver penny, and even floors and what look like benches. So this is where we think we are. So actually, what, the other thing that we find is we find what looks like a cloistral walk in Trench 2. And you can actually see on here, these are little tile patterns. So the tiles are long gone, but you can see in the mortar where the tiles used to be. And this is where we think we are. So we know that Richard's in the church, and churches can either be in the south or in the north, and we haven't got many places that we can actually dig, but we've found that grave up there and what looks like a robbed-out wall. So it's decided to put Trench 3 over on the other side of this wall in the Alderman Newton playground. And pretty quickly, it looks like we've found the church. So we have got large walls, and we've got what looks like two different areas. This could be choir stall footing, and this looks like it's the presbytery. And we find things like tomb lettering, and we did try and spell out Richard, but we didn't have the right letters. And we find lots of things. So we find a medieval silver penny, and we find lots and lots of these reused towels. Now, apparently this is a heraldic eagle, but we now call it the Chicken of Leicester. <laughs> <laughs> So, we realize that actually, where we are in Trench 3 is probably a little bit too far east, and that skeleton is probably looking like it's pretty interesting. It's down the other end of that choir there. So, this is the first day we found it. Um, you can actually see me there with my daughter. I went down to go and see the guys, because I had this phone call saying, look, we found Skeleth remains. So, I went down and had a look. This rather portentous rain cloud came over. <laughs> Massive great storm we had a few minutes later, actually. And um, we covered it up, and this is Jo excavating when we realize where it is, and she starts to realize she's got something pretty amazing. This is Jo Appleby, our osteologist. And she calls Matt Morris, our site director, over and says, I think you better go and get Richard Buckley. He's the head of the University of Leicester Archaeological Services. Now, we're trying to conduct this dig in a quite a quiet, calm fashion. And so Matt doesn't want to shout over that wall in downtown Leicester and say, hey, Richard, you better come and have a look at something. So he goes out and goes to see Richard, who's actually with some experts on friaries at the time. And apparently he's trying to be very sort of nonchalant, you know, sidles up to Richard B and goes, I think you better come and have a look at something. And apparently Richard's quite off-putting and says, look, I've got guests here at the moment. I can't come right now. So Matt's like, no, no, really. I think you better come and have a look at something. <laughs> so apparently Richard's a bit kind of, oh, fine. Walks out, comes all the way around, um, looks down into the trench and sees this. And apparently what he said isn't repeatable. <laughs> So to summarize all of the work that's been done, the multidisciplinary stuff, so osteology, medics, engineers doing CT scans of the wounds, you have got a youngish male with severe battle injuries, with severe scoliosis of the spine in the choir of the Church of the Greyfriars. So all of this is looking pretty likely that it might be Richard. We also have things coming back, like radiocarbon dates are showing that this is, this is in the right period. It's what we're, what we're looking for. Stable isotope data is showing that this person has got a high-status diet. Now, 
that's pretty interdisciplinary, huh? There's lots of stuff going on there. But even now, you can add in the DNA evidence, which itself relies on genealogical research. And that's because even if I could get DNA out of these skeletal remains, it doesn't tell me who this person is. I need to have a relative to compare the DNA to. And I can tell you that as a geneticist, we're all related to Richard III. <laughs> I don't care where you're from, all of us. Now, it's actually been calculated that Richard is going to have between 1 and 17 million relatives alive today who are descended from his immediate family. However, not just any old relative is going to do for this research, and that's very important because I have lots and lots of people who contact me. They email me, they phone me, they try to send me bits of themselves in the post. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> so I get um, envelopes, right? And, and inside are these Q-tips, and they must have once been very wet. By the time I get them, they're dry, but the envelope is a mess, and all the writing's all rumply on the front. I have one chap who seems determined to send me his tooth. I think I've put him off. I hope it's out already, but I think I've managed to put him off. But the problem is, is that vast majority of our DNA is a really complex mixture of that of our ancestors. I can't use it for this sort of identification process. But I can use two tiny bits of DNA that have got a really simple pattern of inheritance down through the generations. These are mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome. So let's have a very quick look at these. Y chromosome has on it the gene which essentially determines maleness. If you have a Y, you're a guy, essentially. So Y chromosome is going to get passed down through the male line. So if I can find somebody alive today who's related to Richard through the male line, I can look at their Y chromosome type and see if it matches that of the skeletal remains. The other bit of DNA I can use is mitochondrial DNA. It's a small circular piece of DNA that's passed down by a mum to all of her children. It's in the egg. So it goes down through the generations, down through the female line. Men don't have eggs, so don't, it's the women who pass it on. So again, if I can find somebody who's related to Richard through the female line, and you can have boys at either end of this chain, it doesn't really matter as long as you've got, oop, an all-female line going through that, I can look at their mitochondrial DNA and see if it matches the skeletal remains and see if there's a match. Now, I'm going to concentrate on the mitochondrial side because we've got 10 minutes, so I can't do the rest of it. So I'm going to do the mitochondrial side. So we actually already had somebody who was related to Richard. This is Michael Ibsen. He's Canadian like me, and he's absolutely gorgeous. Now, he is... He's got the same mitochondrial DNA, or should do, as Richard, because he is descended from Richard's eldest sister, who will have gotten the mitochondrial DNA from Cecily, as will Richard have, down all the way down through this female line, down to here, and he was actually known because of the work of this chap. So this is John Ashdown Hill, and what he'd managed to do was trace down this last little bit to Joy, so Michael's mum, who would have passed down her mitochondrial DNA to him. Now, the problem was, is there was no documentary evidence that this tree was correct. So if there isn't a match in the mitochondrial DNA, how do I know it's not just because the genealogy is wrong? So this is where Professor Kevin Schur came in. He's our pro-vice chancellor for research at the university, but he's also a professor in English local history. And he dug out every single piece of documentary evidence to prove that that tree was correct. And the other thing we were interested in doing was finding a second individual who's also a female line relative. And we managed to find one of those, this lovely lady called Wendy. And I can tell you that the first first time I talked to her, I spent about an hour trying to convince her that I wasn't crazy. <laughs> but she's lovely and took part in the project. It was really important because these guys are related through the female line, and so they should have identical or near-identical mitochondrial DNA types. And if those skeletal remains are Richard, then their mitotype should match that of the skeletal remains. Now, it's a bit of a puzzle of two halves. I've got my modern relatives. That's fine. I just need to get a saliva sample from them, and I can do my modern DNA analysis anywhere I like. That's not the same. That's not what you get with ancient DNA. So after death, our DNA degrades. And if there's anything left, it's going to be in tiny little bits, and there's not going to be very much of it. Now, how quickly it degrades really depends on the burial conditions. Ideally, what you'd like to have is cold and dry. As you can see, that's not what we tend to get in this country. But I was really hopeful that we could get mitochondrial DNA, and that's just because there's so many copies in each of our cells. I was hopeful I might be able to retrieve that from the skeletal remains. Now, this meant, of course, 
doing things like making sure we didn't contaminate the remains. So all you need to do is breathe on these remains, and you're dumping huge amounts of your own long strands of DNA all over it. And it will swamp out any signal of the ancient DNA. So this is Joe and I digging in our very sexy CSI gear, as you can see. And it also meant working in two different ancient DNA labs. And these were one university in Toulouse, University Paul Sabatier in Toulouse, Patricia Ballaresque, and then Mickey Hofreiter up at the University in York now in Germany. And I don't think I need to tell you that Mickey Hofreiter is a bit of a heartthrob in the ancient DNA world. Um, <laughs> It's not why I chose his lab. He's actually one of the biggest names in ancient DNA research. <laughs> so, you guys may have already seen this. It was probably on the TV program. So, uh, this is part of the mitochondrial DNA sequence of Michael Ibsen. It's not everything I did, because it'd be way too long to even put on the screen. But just to give you an idea of what the sequencing looks like when it comes back, this is a chromatogram, and what you're interested in is not the heights of these peaks, but the sequence of those four different colors, because those four different colors represent the four different building blocks of DNA. So this is a, a bit of Michael's mitochondrial sequence, and this is the same bit in Wendy. And as you can see, there's a lovely great match between them. Now, this is the same bit in skeleton one at the Greyfriars site. So again, as you can see, there's a lovely great match between them. So on top of all the interdisciplinary strands that have been brought together, the DNA evidence as well points to these being the remains of Richard. I'd like to show this slide. Um, <laughs> it's fab, isn't it? <laughs> Well, I got sent a ton of stuff after we did the announcement. So, um, <laughs> new sign in Leicester. <laughs> lots and lots of stuff about Baldrick. Lots about how much he'd owe in car parking fines, so about 1.7 million. <laughs> Hide and seek champion, 527 years. Pretty good. <laughs> And then these, these here, so there's a guy on the dig, and his friend works for this company known as Perry Miniatures, and um, they made, within a few days of us doing the announcement, they'd made these little figurines, and it's Richard, and he's bursting out of his car parking spot um, <laughs> with his sword aloft, and rather sweetly, they've got a little disabled sign on the side. I don't know if you can call scoliosis a disability, um, but I thought it was a nice little detail that they had done. Anyways, finally, when Richard Buckley first came to me way back in 2011, <laughs> he was saying to me, look, it'll be fine. I know you've got a background in archaeology. Um, you might want to come work on the dig for a bit. It'll be great. We're never going to find him. If we find him, I'll eat my hat. And this was this thing that he kept saying all through the dig. Oh, if we find Richard, I'll eat my hat. So at the end of the dig... <laughs> uh, a number of cake hats were made, and uh, this is Richard Dooley eating one. And that's it. What really excites me about the performance that I'll do later um, is that I can transform music from 1930s, 1940s and apply electrical tape or other materials that you get these wobulating whirs and um, really experimental kind of dance music sounds.